I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work, as both of these are crucial to our success. And now, I'm delighted to hand things over to the wonderful team from the University of Toronto Libraries, who have a lot to share with us today. So, Desmond and May. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, we are the University of Toronto Libraries team today, uh, like Mercy said, our presentation is going to be Dynamics of Change, continuing the conversation on library naming, finding, and relationship building with Indigenous peoples. Uh, so my name is Desmond Wong, and I am the Outreach Librarian at the University of Toronto Libraries. Uh, we're going to take some time uh, just to introduce ourselves before we also acknowledge the land, I should say. So my main responsibility is to work with Indigenous students, faculty, and staff to build relationships and trust to ensure that the library is living up to its obligations as a settler institution on Indigenous lands. I'm a settler uh, as well as a second generation Chinese diasporic person with ancestral and familial roots through Hong Kong and China. I live and work in the Mississauga of Credit River Territory, which is also Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe ter Territory in what is now Toronto, and I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Hi, um, I'm Mei Chan. I'm the Head of Metadata Services at the University of Toronto Libraries. Uh, my department provides resource description for the libraries in the central library system and varying levels of support for non-central libraries. I'm a second generation Chinese Canadian settler. Uh, my parents grew up in colonial Hong Kong and immigrated to Canada in the 70s. Uh, only very recently though, um, through working with Desmond, did I see immigration as a colonial process displacing Indigenous peoples. So I continue to grapple with the, the tension of being complicit in the, in the system um, systemic repression of Indigenous peoples and being active in supporting reconciliation. Hi folks, my name is Oileen Jace Harrison. I'm a library graduate intern and my major research project was conducting an environmental scan of Canadian libraries response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, specifically in the area of metadata. Oileen is my Chinese name, and Jace is the African name that represents my Jamaican heritage. I am learning about what it means to reconcile with the Indigenous community as both a Black and colored cisgendered woman, and I want to thank the Indigenous community members who have and continue to be patient with me as I learn, and my pronouns are she and her. And hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Lee Morin. I'm the other one of the library graduate interns at the University of Toronto Libraries. Uh, my responsibility in this position was developing an, like a toolkit of sorts to help with the development of Indigenous cultural competency at my library. I'm an urban raised Métis woman and I'm still navigating my privilege of being a white passing cisgendered Indigenous woman and growing up in a big city like Toronto has its privileges. Uh, my pronouns are also she and her. So a little bit about what we're going to do today. Uh, first, we're going to give major uh, an overview of major issues as well as the context of this work uh, so that there's a little bit better understanding of what we are seeing in terms of issues foundationally. Then we will move into uh, the work that Jace has been working on, which is an environmental scan of uh, Canadian institutions on what they are doing in terms of their work with Indigenous uh, communities and folks. Uh, then moving on to the work that Jamie Lee has been doing with the toolkit, uh, which she will explain in more detail. Uh, then we will move on to a conversation about generative engagement. Uh, so we will be talking about the work that has been going on at the University of Toronto Libraries in terms of our own institutional and personal responses to truth and reconciliation. And then finally moving on to the conclusion. So before we go too much further, we would like to do a land acknowledgement led by Desmond. Yes. Uh, so uh, this so this is the land acknowledgement from the University of Toronto. 
Uh, so the land acknowledgement reads as such. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates and by extension, all of us for our work. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Okay, so a little bit of information about uh, the major issues and some of the context. So Indigenous metadata and resource description has taken and continues to take a paternalistic and heteropatriarchal approach to its wording. The words used to current, currently in library metadata reflect a deeply colonial worldview that places Indigenous nations in an incorrect assumptive position of hierarchy and dominion by the nation states which are currently occupying these lands. For example, the broadest Library of Congress subject heading currently states that Indians of North America is the correct usage, uh, which uses both the pejorative and inaccurate term Indians to describe indigenous peoples and placing them within a worldview in a context of a European name for the lands which they steward. These terms do not accurately reflect the complexity of the relationships between these nations, nor their multivariate and complex relationships to the land. However, this metadata issue is not one that can be solved by approaching metadata structures alone. Because Indigenous epistemologies differ so greatly from that of colonial thought, it requires a holistic revision of library structures and services. And to that end, we will be sharing work that has been done at the University of Toronto, but also our colleagues at other institutions. On the face of it, there may not be much of an obvious connection between our various initiatives. However, we hope to reinforce the fact that traditional siloing of library workflows do not work to serve our Indigenous users, nor can this work be solved with library problem-solving solutions. We call for a consultative and relationship-building approach for accountability and relationality of this work. This cannot happen without appropriate knowledge and capacity building in all aspects of library work. To quote Audre Lorde, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. This work we wish to do is liberatory towards collective freedoms in tandem with deep and embodied understanding of how settler colonialism affects and is indeed the foundation of our work and to push towards an emancipated futurity. I will now pass the time on to May who will explain more of the University of Toronto Library's context. So not long after I started at the University of Toronto Libraries in 2018, um, Desmond raised the issues he just outlined to me in a very real way through numerous user complaints about, um, firstly, the use of a Library of Congress subject heading um, Indians of North America, and secondly, um, um, how libraries take a non-granular approach to applying uh, subject analysis and classification to works about Indigenous peoples. So I brought forth these issues to my department and realize, um, although we are the largest cataloging department in the um, system, we would not be able to make changes without consulting other catalogers from the other libraries from within the system. Um, so before going further, I'd like to take the opportunity to describe the environment we work in. Uh, the university is a tri-campus system with seven colleges. Uh, student, faculty, staff, and librarians combined is over 100,000 people. The library system consists of over 40 libraries, 18 of which belong to the central library system, and there are 14 central services, one of which is my department. Uh, there are numerous catalogers throughout the system. Given the complex nature of the library ecosystem, we collaborate formally through tri-campus committees. There are over 20 of these, one of which is the cataloger, Cataloging and Authorities User Group, uh, also known as COG. So I brought forth the issues raised by Desmond to COG in the fall of 2018. At the time, there were mixed responses in terms of taking action, but one out outcome was to express interest in learning about what other Canadian libraries were doing with regards to subject headings. So Desmond and I decided that we needed to meet staff where they were at. We, we took this expressed interest literally, and uh, from that identified two projects, that is, uh, to conduct an environmental scan of what other Canadian libraries were doing and to develop a toolkit to incre increase awareness of issues. 
uh, I, we, we want to em emphasize that this work that we're doing is very much a work in progress. Uh, because it's localized to our workplace, we're not presenting solutions to offer you. Uh, because systemic change is messy, challenging, and slow, we don't want our presentation to be received as a narrative of linear progress. But we do hope that some aspects of our work will resonate with you, that it might lead to connections external to our workplace for mutual and critical learning. And so I will pass the time over to Jace to share uh, the findings from the environmental scan project that she did. Hi folks, as was said, I'll be giving a very high level overview of my major research project, which was the environmental scan. So the central research question that I tried to answer was, how are Canadian academic libraries responding to the TRC calls to action in the area of metadata? As the scan progressed, I ventured outside of academic libraries and began to interview associations, public and school libraries, and some archives. Since so many people are forming partnerships and collaborations, this made sense. I also ventured outside of metadata. Um, it was more common to find an individual or handful of librarians working on these projects, and they would be volunteers from whichever department they were situated. Um, at the project's end, I had conducted semi structured interviews with over 40 librarians and archivists representing 38 institutions across Canada. To begin, I wanted to establish that the issues that we are addressing in our catalog, as was said before, are reflective of the larger systemic oppression of Indigenous folks. Uh, Marissa Ellen Adore and Miranda Bullard Lewis write that understanding how colonialism works can help those in the field of knowledge organization appreciate the power dynamics embedded in the marginalization of Native American and Indigenous peoples materials. Many librarians have expressed to me how it is important that we acknowledge and recognize that we are addressing structural issues, not just vocabulary. Uh, the images on the slide were taken from the Manitoba Archival Information Networks Project, so Maine, and in the team's corresponding article, they discuss how Library of Congress, Congress's organizational structure is the same as the Canadian government's organization of Indigenous peoples. And after consulting with the Indigenous communities in the Manitoba, Manitoba area, the main team determined that the image on the right was more reflective of how Indigenous communities viewed themselves. So librarians have obviously been encountering several barriers when attempting to change or improve metadata on Indigenous materials. Some of the major ones being that this is very labor and resource intensive work. Many libraries don't have the funding, time, and skilled personnel needed to carry out this work. And this is especially true for smaller libraries. Also, a lot of these items just need to be recatalogued. They weren't catalogued correctly to begin with. Librarians are asking, how do we negotiate our attention between new materials moving into the collection and recataloging old materials? Another barrier is the sharing of records across institutions. How can we ensure that information professionals are using the same terminology to describe Indigenous materials? Who is using their resources to determine this terminology through consultation with the community? How do we maintain the value of records? Many institutions are also a part of a consortia, consortium or use LSPs like OCLC that don't allow them to make those changes themselves. Another barrier is holistic change. Um, the need for holistic change from other departments within their library or institution. This change can't happen in isolation. The library is a fully integrated system and we need to communicate across departments in order to maintain consistency. So, and also, are these changes happening in tandem with changes to the academic and uh, or institutional program, programming from which the library is situated in? Another barrier is social change. Um, I'll discuss later, but the political influence, and this refers to the last slide as well. If the catalog is reflective of the federal government's organization of Indigenous peoples, can one change without the other? Uh, both should change and cultural competency, them or their peers, not having the required knowledge of Indigenous worldviews and ontologies to make the appropriate changes, uh, and a colonial cu culture, lastly. 
uh, a lot of librarians are receiving pushback from their peers and management because libraries are still very white spaces. So now I'm going to give a very high level overview of some of the major strategies that librarians are using to combat these barriers. Um, it's important to acknowledge that every institution is very much on their own journey of reconciliation because every institution has a unique relationship with their Indigenous patrons and community. So classification. Um, if the Indigenous material is about science, art, language, then it obviously shouldn't be in the history section. So some librarians have um, just put it in, just changed the material to have the correct subject heading. Some libraries have taken this a step further and made labels for Indigenous materials so that they are more easily identifiable on bookshelves. For example, one library hired an Indigenous artist to design a label for their Indigenous materials. Uh, librarians are torn on whether adding these distinctive labels just continues to ghettoize Indigenous materials, but makes them more spread out across the shelves. The same debate carries over to folks who have made an Indigenous special collection. Does this still ghettoize materials, but in a different way? Um, supporting the community collection. Many universities have an Indigenous or First Nations Center that houses a community collection that is outside of the library catalog. One librarian is assisting their First Nations Center by developing, by developing a unique classification schema and cataloging system for them. Others are merging the community catalog with the central library system. Lastly, some librarians are simply maintaining the LOC or Dewey classification schemas. For example, at one library, after having consulted with the community, it was decided they would maintain LOC classification because Indigenous users liked the fact that they were able to find all of the materials they needed in one area. So again, this shows how it depends on the community and what their needs are. So in terms of cataloging, most libraries are changing broad terms like off-reservation boarding school to residential school or Eskimo to Inuit. These are easier to change in the catalog because they're indisputable, easy to consult on. Um, most institutions have replaced Indians of North America with Indigenous peoples dash North America. Folks are also using variants of this, so First Nations, Aboriginal, et cetera. Um, but for this example specifically, we must also keep in mind that Indian, Indigenous, Aboriginal, et cetera, are all still umbrella terms used to describe a very diverse group of peoples, and they're all still colonial terms. So even if we get more regionally specific, North America includes thousands of nations across Turtle Island and is still homogenizing. Um, some libraries are creating local subject headings, and this is a temporary fix. Uh, they are creating local subject headings using vocabulary lists developed by the Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs, Manitoba Archival Information Network, Maine, and UBC's WIWA Library. Uh, most recently, the CFLA's Indigenous Matters Committee released the FNMIIO, or the First Nations Inuit and Métis Indigenous Ontology, and it is still going through consultation, but this gives the correct name of every nation in what we now call Canada. It is important to keep in mind that the lists on the slide were consulted with and developed for their specific user communities. So this is not an excuse for not consulting or building a relationship with Indigenous users at your library. Enhancing records. Adding correct terminology to existing records, to existing records through um, external research. So one library hired an Indigenous student to look through Indigenous materials um, in their library subject by subject. When I interviewed them, I believe they were on Indigenous science materials, and the student would look through um, each material for, for content, and that metadata librarian would then use that, that um, research to enhance the corresponding record. Uh, link data. Lastly, librarians are considering link data. Using something like Wikidata would allow librarians to create a network of terminology rather than a hierarchy. And this would also enable variant spellings and terminologies for the same subject. For example, the different spellings of Anishinaabe. 
This will also enable Indigenous community members to make these changes without having to go through institutional restrictions. So libraries are also trying to disperse the labor as much as possible. They're developing relationships with publishers, vendors, and LSP providers um, so that the changes can be made from the source. Librarians have argued that if enough professionals are asking publishers, vendors, and LSP providers for metadata changes and script developments, then maybe they'll be making those permanent systemic changes within their organizations. Uh, further addressing this labor barrier, librarians are also collaborating with public libraries, school libraries, and archives in the area to share and distribute labor. Some working groups, like the one we have in the GTA called the Colonizing Description, have librarians from across the province working together to share strategies. Uh, some library, libraries are applying for a NACO or SACO funnel membership so that they can contribute new name and subject authorities through PCC. If more libraries are contributing to NACO and SACO, it's the same idea um, that each that members um, from each region can then add the proper terminology for Indigenous nations in their communities. Critiques of this are, even if we are adding subject and name authorities through NACO and SACO, that would involve hundreds of subject headings and would still take a very long time, which is why uh, librarians view that it's a better option to be pushing for changes from higher up at LOC. So librarians, Oh, sorry, I missed on the last slide. <laughs> waiting for changes to be made at a higher level. So lastly, to be quite frank, a lot of libraries are waiting for changes to be made at a higher level through the Library of Congress and Library and Archives Canada. And until that happens, librarians are doing patchwork. Everything I mentioned before is patchwork. Um, indigenous communities and cultures will change as is natural, and we will keep on having to consult and make these changes ourselves until there is systemic change across Canada. So librarians are split on whether we should be making these patchwork changes or not. Some argue, hey, I don't wanna do all of this work just for LAC or LOC to turn around, change everything, and then I have to do it all over again. Other librarians recognize that, as I said at the beginning of this section, these are political and human rights issues. If you choose to be an active, that is a political choice. And with this in mind, many librarians have argued that if we wait for changes from LAC and LOC, we may be waiting for a very long time um, because this would involve changes from, as I said before, probably the American government and the Canadian government as well. Um, Emily Drabinsky suggests that patchwork is not necessarily a bad thing, but rather it is a tool that points out the ruptures in a structure and it makes the coloniality of the system much more visible. It makes visible that our Western classification and knowledge systems were not created with indigenous or even black or colored or queer folks in mind. And we need complete systemic change to happen at LAC and LOC, but it is also important that this continues happening at a grassroots level. Now I'm going to pass it over to Jamie, who's going to be talking about the toolkit. All right, thank you so much, Jay. Uh, so as was mentioned earlier in this presentation, my main project during my time at the University of Toronto Libraries has been the development of a toolkit geared towards non-Indigenous librarians. The goal of this toolkit is to assist with the development of workplace cultural competency, especially when it comes for working with and for Indigenous patrons and materials at our library. Uh, the researching component of developing the toolkit began in 2018, and what this looked like was examining materials such as books, presentations, and other toolkits from different fields to see how the development of Indigenous knowledges and understandings within their workplaces was approached. We're anticipating that a good copy of this toolkit will be, well, at least a good draft of a copy will be completed this month with an eventual internal release. Um, and in additional recognition of how times can change, and in also acknowledging what Jace mentioned earlier about things changing, 
This toolkit was developed with the anticipation that it would grow over time or perhaps be potentially adapted if things go well. So part of this that I'm going to share with you today is um, for the design decision was actually to take a user experience design approach, specifically by creating a persona and an empathy map. So I have on the screen a sample of what the empathy map looks like. So the way that I approach this was taking into consideration conversations that I've had with librarians over my years of being in the field with librarians as I've been working with physicians and kind of just figuring out what an average starting point would be for everyone. So in all, I considered three major perspectives for non-Indigenous librarians. The first perspective being not knowing much or anything about Indigenous issues experiences and history and wanting to learn. Uh, the second one being some knowledge with a desire to improve in this knowledge. And the third being having considerable knowledge and would either like a refresher or to have a resource to point to those who are not as far along in their learning journey. With these personas made, which in the, this image in, on the screen would be the individual in the middle, I developed three empathy maps, one for each journey. And I was thinking, I was looking at what this person was thinking as they're at this point in their journey, what they're seeing, they're doing, and they're hearing. Um, as a result, I was very deliberate with its uh, development, right down to the wording, because I wanted to be sure that this was accessible and to reflect the multitude in ways in which we all access and learn. So this is the current format of the toolkit. This could still change. Um, I began with a land acknowledgement, uh, then I talk about information authority a little bit, then I get into the 101. This section covers more terminology and assumptions. I also talk about some conversations with colleagues, and towards the end, it will have resources and bibliography. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, I won't be going over every single part of the toolkit, but I will be highlighting specific sections. So as you heard earlier uh, with Desmond, he gave a land acknowledgement. And uh, according to indigenous.utrano.ca, uh, the land acknowledgement is a formal statement recognizing the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territory. Um, so it also recognizes the land in which we live and work on. And even though for many of us who are attending today, uh, our ancestors may not have been a part of the early settlers who ended up staying on these lands, but we're all invited into the spirit of the treaty being where we are today, no matter where you're tuning in from. Um, and then I go into about uh, information authority. So information authority is the idea of what we learn is not often determined by us firsthand, but we often learn about it through secondary source. So this could be something like going to school and then your teacher teaches it to you, your history textbook. Um, but with this in mind, as information professionals, we are the ones who are acting as knowledge meteors. We are often the secondary source that people are going to for information. So we need to know what we're doing, basically. We have the ability to shift perce perceptions. And this is where, as people with information authority, we're so important. Um, so for an example, um, if you're looking at an item within your library, uh, something I want to consider, and this is something I often consider as I look at books, is who created this item and what is the reason? Is this person Indigenous? If so, what is their nation and who claims them? If they aren't Indigenous, was this item created in consultation with Indigenous people or created about them with no consultation? Does this item harm or help the community? So an example that I have here is actually from one of our libraries at, uh, at school. And this is a Mi'kmaq dictionary of phonographic word lists, which was imprinted in 1902. So initially, this is actually an example of a tool used to undermine indigenous languages, cultures, and worldviews at the time of its creation. By having access to indigenous languages, there was an ability to translate Bibles into those Indigenous languages to share stories that were perhaps not meant to be shared beyond the maritimes, as one example, but also in terms of 
getting in and starting to harm indigenous cultures. But now, this book has a new function as a tool for language revitalization because the Mi'kmaq dialect that was used in this book was actually closer to what many of our ancestors spoke uh, for the Mi'kmaq. So it is also a tool as well. So this is something that is both harmed and helped the community. Um, another example is a book that's actually held in Fisher Library, which is a rare book library. Um, and it's an Anishinaabe Moan Bible. And last year, during the International Year of Indigenous Languages, this book, among many others, were brought up for an event involving several Indigenous community members from on and off campus. Many of them were language teachers. So these copies were able to be viewed and help out with language revitalization locally, which is actually very helpful. Uh, the next section will look more into terminology. So this is something to kind of show some shifts in language not just in the workplace, but beyond. So for example, these are two sayings that I have heard in various workplaces, which are not really appropriate to say whatsoever. Um, so instead of saying something like, let's have a powwow about this, I don't know why you'd wanna have a powwow about it. Uh, it's not a very, <laughs> like your meeting is probably not a very significant cultural event that can last upward of three days. Just say that you want to meet about it instead. Um, and the same goes for saying uh, they've gone off the reservation. Just say that they're acting of their own accord because um, this saying that they're going off the reservation calls back to a time when First Nations folks who lived on reserves had had to seek permission from an Indian agent to leave the reservation to do what they needed to do, such as hunt or sell. And most of the time, these uh, requests were denied. Uh, minimum punishment was three months in jail and it got a lot worse from there. So let's just talk about something else. Um, so the next section is about taking responsibility. So this way, this section will discuss ways to begin developing and sustaining meaningful relationships between non-Indigenous librarians and in respective Indigenous communities. So every relationship will look, begin, and be maintained differently. So the approach for this area is quite generalist. And then this next section is actually still under development right now, which is conversations with colleagues. So this section will look more at how to begin having conversations with colleagues, perhaps even your bosses and superiors at work about Indigenous issues. So there's some preliminary plans that will be happening in the next year, uh, such as presenting to a wider range of colleagues, building a community of practice, and learning through book clubs. Um, and this actually goes nicely over to the next section. I'm going to pass it over to May. Thanks, Jamie. So um, it's important to note that while uh, well, that we regard the two projects that Jason and Jamie Lee presented on as part of a long-term engagement process, rather than for the sake of the projects themselves as, as just independent outputs. As Jace had pointed out, one of the um, findings in uh, her, her environmental scan was the barrier around um, uh, like the need for holistic change, that it can't just be one area of library service um, trying to make a systemic change. It needs to be the whole system. So um, I'm going to just give some examples of how we have been shifting our approach to um, uh, implementing something uh, more 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 holistically. So this will be um, internal and external. So I'll talk a little bit about internal engagement. Um, so you know, as as uh, very early on in the project, actually even before Jace had um, discovered that finding in her in her scan, we discovered that we needed to engage more people than just the catalogers. Uh, there was kind of a um, a sentiment that this was a personal project of ours. And so when we had heard that, um, just that kind of feedback, we're, we're, we were um, thinking we need to appeal to senior staff to, um, to, to share this work with us in, in different areas of library service. So um, we, of course, we started with the cataloger, uh, the COG group, the cataloging authorities user group, and we had uh, four meetings. Um, to raise the issue, and this included um, opportunities for Jace, Jamie um, um, to present on their work, which generated more conversations 
And it started to shift the conversation from how do we do it, because there's a lot of how barriers, uh, to simply agreeing that we need to do it. I think that was um, a really um, uh, important uh, shift. And so we're very pleased to see that the work to examine our cataloging classification practices is, 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 is going to be in um, our current year's work plan. Um, as part of um, um, you know, inviting other parts of the library to participate, then we made a couple of presentations to senior staff, one about this time of year um, last year. And as a result of that, uh, the uh, head archivist actually reached out to our, our team uh, for information around what can archives, what can archivists do. So uh, that was fantastic uh, to have uh, another part of the library um, just take initiative. And uh, so we were able to do a presentation with the, with the, the tri-campus archivist group. And then um, we had a follow-up meeting with senior staff uh, earlier this year. And um, that conversation, um, I, I would call it a generative conversation, uh, led to this idea. Somebody proposed that maybe we need to form a community of practice to create a safe space for people to admit what they don't know and to, um, and to learn or relearn. And uh, Desmond and I took this idea of a community practice um, and, and we, we were quite excited about it. And we thought one concrete thing we could do to, to, to build towards that is to pilot a book club. So I'm going to pass the time on to Desmond to talk uh, about that. Great, thank you, May. Um, just before I talk about the book club, book, excuse me, book club pilot, um, I just wanted to clarify uh, for folks who maybe are unaware of the University of Toronto Library Structure, senior staff is a gathering and a meeting of of the library directors, managers, um, as well as the uh, University of Toronto Library's executive, which includes our university librarian and all the associate university librarians and directors. Uh, so this was uh, really a meeting of management. So to talk about the book club pilot, uh, what we were really thinking about when we were putting together the idea of the book club and bringing to senior staff as a meeting point is that this is an initiative that needs to be taken on by many people uh, across all the library, uh, as May has pointed out. So this isn't simply a metadata issue or for me a services issue because Indigenous students, Indigenous users and our metadata uh, as well as our work goes across the entire university library system and the university campus. And so it's important for everybody to be able to think about and learn about Indigenous issues. So in order to increase opportunities for interaction and cultural competency, we work together to create opportunities to learn together. This was spurred by an expressed need by library staff for a space to dialogue uh, and was also encouraged by Indigenous community members that we work with uh, through the course of our other library work. The book that we read was Chelsea Vowell's Indigenous Rights, a guide to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit issues as a primer for our discussions. The idea of a digital discussion space and a book club was uh, initially brought forward by May, and it received a lot of great support from library administration and attendees. We discussed a variety of difficult topics, including treaties, identities, terminologies, and nationhoods, amongst others. Uh, these were really difficult conversations, uh, but I think they were really generative, and there was a lot of aha moments, uh, as Oprah would call them, uh, and a lot of other situations where we had some really difficult time, times um, talking about our own privilege and looking at our places and locating ourselves within settler colonialism. Participants were encouraged to bring supplemental materials to share with the group, and we structured the learning space to be an open and respectful place facilitated by colleagues. We don't want to give off the impression that after this one book club, we're suddenly culturally competent. This is not something uh, that you can turn on and off like a switch or check off uh, as a uh, something that is now not on your list. Uh, this book club is only one part of a series of initiatives, past, present, and future, that aim to increase knowledge of obligations, traditional stories, ways of being and worldviews. As a next step, uh, we will be working towards a permanent community of practice among staff to continue learning and checking in with Indigenous community members in an iterative manner. So while this research that Jace and Jamie has, has, has done gave us the opportunity to engage with staff internally, 
It's also important for us to stay connected with the larger environment that we're part of. It's a way for us to stay accountable to um, the work that we're doing. It's a way to hold the, the, the institution that we're part of accountable and to um, be, be part of something that's like in flux and informative and to, to try to maintain a critical lens. Um, so this slide gives, um, um, it gives a list of some external communities and networks that we are a part of. Um, and uh, the, uh, we're very lucky, I would have to say we're very lucky to be part of um, the GTA community in the sense that uh, York University and Ryerson University have been very instrumental in leading the way for, um, for, for just opening up the conversation around changing our metadata metadata practices. So uh, their leadership is something that we um, basically have taken and we uh, are learning through the, the work and the, the ground that they're breaking. And, um, and so we're playing a little catch up, but uh, you know, all organizations are, are different and, and the size of our organization is, is one thing that we're still trying to kind of um, figure out. So I just wanted to give a shout out to York and Ryerson uh, universities. So um, and uh, there's just other types of networks that we're part of that are at an international level, uh, Big Heads, um, the Oakdale Sea Focus Groups, and um, part of the uh, Canadian Federation Library Association, FCI Bay. Um, so yeah, these are just examples of, of ways we are staying connected externally in addition to the internal work that we're doing. So that's pretty much it for our presentation. And uh, I guess we have, um, a, a good good chunk of time now um, to um, address any questions. Yes, so uh, May, Desmond, Jace, Jamie Lee, thank you so much uh, for sharing. You've shared uh, so much useful information and um, you know, there's much to learn from your experiences. Um, I think folks are probably still um, uh, just processing and so I'm gonna give you all um, a little bit of time to uh, pop some uh, some of your comments or questions into chat. I have a, a few that um, have come in that I'll get started with now, and I do encourage um, you all to um, ask the uh, ask your questions and, and share your comments here. So uh, Karen Smith Yoshimura asks. Is there a map that indigenous peoples all agree on uh, that shows what the geographical divisions um, should be from their perspectives? Um, just a, as a useful resource for you know those of us who are trying to get a better sense of um, a, a, a you know a, a map that shows those geographical divisions that might be just more respectful of indigenous perspectives. Do any of you have um, uh, something that comes to mind? So I think that, to be honest, there probably isn't a map necessarily that is agreed upon um, through consultation. I think that maps in general and that kind of uh, that that kind of knowledge gathering um, is more of a colonial or a Western concept. Um, however, there have been a few cartographers, I will say, or people who work in um, geospatial work that have tried to gather materials uh, similar to what you're describing. Uh, so what I'm thinking of is a map called native-lands.ca. Um, I will pop that into the chat for everybody. Um, this is, they, they recognize that this is a growing and iterative um, map as well, similar to all of the work that we ourselves are doing in terms of the types of things that we want to do with library work. Um, so this is really just a starting point, kind of illustrative to show, um, you know, stewardship, uh, stewardship, ongoing relationships to land. Um, but it also encourages you, of course, to move into speaking to local communities and doing that consultative work. So as a st I would really only recommend native-lands.ca as a starting point to kind of start to inform your conversations about uh, who and what uh, you, your relationships are, uh, as well as what relationships the materials you might be describing or the type of work that you might be doing is, uh, but really only that, that it's a starting point and not something that is necessarily authoritative. 
Thank you for pointing us to that, uh, Desmond. And also, thank you for the important uh, point about uh, these resources and this information being a starting point. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, that, that third part of your uh, webinar title, the relationship building, um, and that, again, direct outreach and relationship building is, is really the uh, key part of that. Um, I was wondering if um, there's a way that uh, you or anyone else on the team might speak to um, a little bit about how these efforts are um, influencing and have impacted the relationship building that you are doing with uh, the indigenous communities that you work with and serve. So uh, I open up the time as well to um, my colleagues, but I think in terms of the types of work that we're trying to do, um, when we, so I've, I've been in my position at the University of Toronto Libraries now for approximately four years. And when I started, the University of Toronto Libraries, uh, save for a select few people, really weren't engaging with the community that frequently. Uh, so what we did, uh, first of all, was we just shifted complete focus to building relationships um, and approaching the community not with here's what we need done and this is what uh, we need your help with, but instead uh, with kind of a different reciprocal relationship, which is uh, we are here to assist you in whatever you need. Uh, what labor do you need us to take on and how can we help um, Indigenous students, faculty and staff at the university through library work? And so that shift in our process was really helpful in creating um, really strong relationships with Indigenous faculty and students and staff uh, at the university. In terms of this work now, uh, I think that this gives us a little bit more of an idea about what we need to do. I think it was pretty clear to begin with what um, issues that Indigenous students were having when they were approaching our catalogs, um, what we were getting in terms of the complaints that May mentioned that started the impetus for all of this work. Um, but also that a lot of these things that Indigenous folks are asking for uh, are not things that can necessarily be taken up just by one or two people, which is why it's so important for us to have Jamie Lee's work with the toolkit, to have Jace's work with uh, the environmental scan to say other universities and other university library systems and institutions are doing these things and we are falling behind in terms of our obligations as a settler institution on these lands. And so um, really the advocacy work I find has been uh, to do with our, our library system um, more so than with the relationship that we already have and is very strong with Indigenous community members. Thank you for that, um, Desmond. It's it's so helpful to hear and and again just hearing how uh, engaging more people across your um, institution is is really key to this, bringing more folks on board. So uh, a related question. Um, so this is from Jay Levinson. As a Native American Mohawk, my question is for those of us um, who are not librarians, but uh, in a staff position, what could we do to help get this process started in our institution? Um, you know, something like maybe referring to that map, I think. Uh, there is a map that is available. It's also in this comment. Um, so I don't know if, if any of you would have some advice about um, know, staff who would like to uh, get these conversations, get get something going at their institutions. Um, maybe I can speak to that a little. I, I obviously can't speak to it as an Indigenous person, but from the Indigenous folks that I have spoken to in the scan, um, I think that Unfortunately, um, for a lot of folks who have tried to get these initiatives started in their library, there was a lot of pushback. Um, that's from other librarians who are, are their peers, from other staff, if they're, they're just staff, or from management, or even sometimes the chief librarian. Um, so it is a lot of emotional labor if you are an Indigenous person. Um, uh, I'll just say that. And then in terms of getting things started, um, a lot of non-Indigenous librarians have just been trying to um, change the culture as a starting point. Um, so um, increasing cultural competency for staff, whether that be through um, showing things like University of Alberta's MOOC um, seminar or um, having other documentary screenings, 
just trying to create public awareness that there is a problem so that people will acknowledge that there's a problem and then move from there. So I'm also going to jump here in here as well with some thoughts. Um, so there, there's, there's two ideas. Like one is, you know, right now, given the current social climate um, with just the concerns around um, racism, anti-Black racism, um, and all the social unrest that's happening, I think there is a very, I think, like, it's very relevant to hold our institutional uh, institutions accountable uh, where, you know, it's in a strategic, you know, plan or something that, that where it says we value diversity, equity, inclusion, right? And, and so, you know, sometimes you read these documents and it just seems like such, you know, it seems very performative. And I would say, you know, that that's something to kind of, um, you know, pin it to. You know, like like make our institutions like um, 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 do something concrete based on um, those values. So that would be one way. Um, and another way would be, you know, to, to to talk find find people in the institution who may be thinking the same things or who are concerned about the same things. Um, in, at the University of Toronto Libraries, you know, the thing that moved me to action was a couple of factors. One was um, like working with Desmond and learning from Desmond. And um, and then also it was very undeniable that our user community had issues with the language we were using in um, our catalog. So it was, I would like to say, user driven in that sense. So if you're able to find a user voice, um, um, and, and it, it, you know, it could be external users, library users, but you know, there's also internal library users, uh, then there may be um, some, um, something to build on from there. Thank you, May. I'm just going to add really quickly to that. Um, in terms of like being potentially the only person in your institution, Jay, um, just finding some like-minded individuals at your workplace and seeing where they stand and just beginning. Uh, this is where having conversations with folks might be really important in getting people to kind of see where you're at and hopefully they'll move forward. Also finding some other folks who are working in a similar place as you, maybe not at the same workplace, but who also understand and kind of getting together and seeing how you can all collectively push forward for a good change at your workplace could also be a good start. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have much more except uh, good luck. I wish you would be up to the best with that. Thank you, Jamie Lee. I, I appreciate your sharing that. And, and Jay, thank you for asking asking the question. Um, we have a, another question that's uh, come in. Um, this is from Violet Fox. Uh, and so to the panelists, are you aware of any gatherings or events being planned, uh, like the Sorting Libraries Out conference? Again, we're just looking for uh, places to gather and learn more uh, and, and really educate ourselves and listen and learn. Just wondering if you have any uh, suggestions or recommendations. So there have been a few meetings that have been put together uh, in the past, which were in the slides. Uh, so that includes the kind of drawing a blank here, the decolonizing description uh, symposium and a number of other symposia that were put together uh, by catalogers. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID and the the adjacent budget cuts to that are accompanying COVID, um, I'm not really sure about what is going to happen in terms of these meetings. Um, but I think that uh, they will hopefully be on the horizon again soon once things uh, go back to normal. That's that's what I would think. I don't know that there are any digital experiences that are currently in the process of being planned, um, but maybe some of my colleagues do. Thanks, thanks, Desmond, and uh, you know your mention of uh, COVID and. Um, you know, some of the events obviously being canceled, um, you know, it just, it just raises the important point of um, in a time of global pandemic uh, is when um, 
we as, as staff and, and we as institutions uh, need to really uh, double down on our commitment to issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion because um, often it, uh, and maybe more so at some of the leadership and administration level, um, it could seem like um, now just isn't a good time. Um, and so I think as, as folks are, are uh, quick to point out that uh, an institution's budget is a moral document, um, and so to ensure that um, uh, a lot of these activities and efforts uh, don't somehow get pushed aside, uh, regardless of uh, the financial pressures that uh, institutions are, are facing. Um, so uh, we do um, hope that from our panelists and from our attendees that if you have any um, uh, knowledge of some of these events that are being planned um, or good places to look, um, and May has just shared something, um, I, it would just be wonderful to have this knowledge. It's clear that we're, we're all eager to learn more. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any other, uh, let's see, let me just see if there are some other questions that have come up. Um, oh, I, I did see that uh, Karen Smith Yoshimura asked, um, would there be a need to add indigenous people's languages to Wikidata? I know that Wikidata was um, mentioned in one of the earlier slides and just wondering if any of you had any thoughts on that. I can talk to that pretty quickly. Um, I know that there has been some moves to actually get indigenous languages on Wikipedia as a whole. So theoretically having the support of having indigenous languages in the Wikidata end would potentially be helpful. But if it's like even just in like regular languages, I can't see like English. I don't see how that wouldn't be helpful to have that included as well, because there is actually a vast underrepresentation of indigenous content on Wikipedia and Wikidata as a whole. So the more contribution with properly cited resources there are, the better chances that it has to stay. Uh, I don't know if any of my colleagues have anything to add to that. Well, thank you, Jamie Lee. I think that's you pointed yet to another place that folks might uh, contribute as they have um, uh, information and interest. So since we are just about uh, at time and at the top of the hour, um, May, Desmond, Jamie Lee, and Jace, I want to thank you so much for sharing uh, your experiences. We've learned so much from you, some really some great ideas for how to get started, the conversations to have, the relationships to build. I think you're absolutely correct about those are uh, the key starting points. Um, and so we will be sharing um, the links sh and resources shared today. There will be a link to the recording. I will email uh, everyone who's registered um, afterwards uh, within a couple days uh, with this information. So thank you to our panelists uh, and to all of you for joining us today. We really appreciate your attendance and your participation. Um, and we wish you well for the rest of the day. And thank you. And this concludes today's webinar. Bye-bye.